Amen. Oh, well, hello, everybody. Carrying on with this uh, Gospel of Matthew. Last week, last two weeks, actually, has been pretty heavy going. I felt like I've been carried along by God's grace, and I've just kind of drifted into the sermons and things like that, and I felt like I hit a wall this week. I'm like, I think I finished preaching all the sermons I could preach now. I'm tired, um, but here I am, so let's see what happens. Uh, <laughs> God is good. Um, but you know, a couple of weeks ago we talked about authority and respecting authority and following a godly pattern of authority and how that's directly related to how the spiritual realm works, how our spiritual gifts work, that when we get things in, 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 in the order that God has designed it uh, with authority. We talked about um, the centurion who astonished Jesus like crazy, uh, like, and he was a Gentile. No, Israel had done that to him. He's like, oh my goodness, you've got more faith than I realise, you know, he understands authority. He goes, I don't, don't come and see me, I know about authority, I'm in authority, I'm over people in authority, you say the word and it will be done. And Jesus said the word and it was done. And then I said, the only other person that really astonished Jesus in the Gospels was the, uh, that other Gentile woman, woman. It's a big long name and in the different Gospels it's, it, it refers to her in a different kind of name, Sophronician or I don't know, I'm not even attempted to remember, I can't remember, maybe you do. Does anyone remember? Yeah, this, the reason why it's confusing because in the two different Gospels it refers to as a different kind of location and probably that's why it doesn't stick and it's a hard name in and of itself but you know she was up to going up to Jesus this gentle woman goes yeah I want I'll, you know can you do something for me and Jesus was like no it's not right for me to toss you know is it right to give the bread the children's bread to dogs and she, and you know she had the just amazing humble response and said look even the dogs get the scraps that fall from the children's table and he would again like the other gentile he was just astonished like wow oh woman he says oh woman how great is your faith almost elevated her to like almost abraham sort of status like oh, from you're a dog as a test to accept a humble position to then be highly exalted it follows the pattern of christ who was highly exalted in heaven was hum humble on a cross despised and then highly exalted you know, if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. If you humble yourself, God will exalt you. But then you take that exaltation, you don't absorb it to yourself and you give glory to God. Just like King David, we talked about when people broke the line. He goes, I'm thirsty. They understood authority, these guys. They broke through the line. They got in some water. He received the water. And what did he do? Not absorb it to himself, but he made sure God got all the glory. So you can have authority structures all right and in place in your home and in your church and everything like that. But if you've got an arrogant person at the top, you block it. The head of the church, the head of our homes, the head of our lives is, the, is Jesus Christ. And if we have arrogance or pride or something that's capping over the top, it just blocks the spiritual uh, blessing that flows. It says in Timothy that if men, well, you need to lift up holy hands. Lift up holy hands. Not violently, not... Lift up holy hands. You know, it talks about in Peter about being humble... We need to be humble and prefer one another, not domineering and things like that. So it's very important that through all of us, men, women, children, everyone, that we are come to the Lord with humility of heart. You know, as soon as arrogance seeps in, whether it be through anyone, that's where strife occurs and that's where it becomes about man and not God. But I want to be part of a group of people where ultimately everything that we're about is about the glorification of our amazing God. Are you with me? It can be, we can follow a human system and we can have the name Christian over the top of it. We can say in our statement of beliefs and in our constitution that we're all about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But I tell you what, it's very easy to have the right words in place and absorb all the glory for yourself and live for yourself. We're a people that sacrifice our lives for the Lordship of Christ and for others with humility. If we can get that right, oh boy, who knows what might happen. Who knows what might happen? And so that was a couple of weeks ago. Last week we talked about, um, you know, spiritual authorities. We looked at the next passage that we were up to in Matthew and about uh, Jesus uh, going out on his first, what appears in Matthew anyway, his first missionary trip to not just Gentile people, but to Gentile territory. There were storms. He was in a boat. The water represents, you know, in those days, the spiritual places, which is why it was so cool when Jesus walked on the water, Yeah. Uh, he overcame it, he, he calmed the seas down, he had spiritual authority over that place and he walked, came across the waters like Moses went through the Red Sea to a promise for the Gentile people 
and his first two people that were welcoming, the two people on the door that day were two demon-possessed men, probably people you wouldn't want to choose, but they were the people right there. They were represent the spiritual stronghold over the territory. Jesus confronted them, cast out the demons, they wanted to follow him, but he was instead sent. Those demon-possessed people were sent to the Decapolis to preach the Word of God and draw many people to him, just like he did to a Samaritan woman who was sent from the well, a sinful woman who shouldn't have been talked to, who was talked to, who then was, was quickly used by, the, by God to draw people into the Kingdom of God, into the Samaritan area. God wants to use sin-riddled people like you and I to do extraordinary things. And the reason why He can use sin-riddled people is because we recognise we're sin-riddled people and we need the grace of God on our life and when we are humble of heart and we recognise we are weak, that's when the power of God can come through strongly. And then the power of God works through our life and our temptation is, well, that was pretty good actually, I might be all right. And then, you know, we, we, we absorb the glory and then it's like, oh, we, we're done for. The 12 apostles that were sent out, they used to have arguments about who was the greatest. They did amazing things for Christ and they quickly forgot they were under His grace, thought they were operating in their own strength and started to think they were pretty good. Jesus quickly rebuked them. Peter was one of those, he thought he was pretty good, he never denied Christ until... He was away from Christ, didn't realise that him being close and standing by Christ all the time was actually his source of strength and empowerment and that when he was walking with him, he was bold as a lion, you know? But when he felt that distance and he was by himself, he couldn't help but deny, deny, deny. And Jesus came back and affirmed him, affirmed him, affirmed him. Day of Pentecost came, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and power and he had that chip on his shoulder, like chip on his shoulder in a sense, but he knew his weakness He goes, oh man, I need God's grace. The next time he was confronted with the same people that he saw before that he denied Christ, he was bold and he was just shocked people about his boldness and they're like, wow, he's an unlearned person. How can he be so bold? He understood the key of of what it was to be successful in the Kingdom of God was, was to be the least, to recognize him. Paul had the same issue, oh, Lord, take this thorn out of my flesh, you know. Ah. He goes, I put it there because I know you, Paul, if you don't have that struggle, you're going to be arrogant and then what am I going to do? <laughs> like, he goes, okay, your grace is sufficient for me, your power is made perfect in my weakness. And so, we looked at that last week, spiritual territory, we talked about, you know, I shared my story about Halloween and how I was born on Halloween, following a curse, basically presented to my mum through fortune teller in her younger days, that was broken in Jesus' name and we keep moving forward. And I had a challenge for all of us here last week and I don't know if anyone bothered to follow through with it, uh, but the challenge was to renounce anything that you have had experience in with fortune telling, tarot cards, you know, reading of star signs, um, any spiritual thing, any weird horror books that might have some spiritual connotation, any Buddhas that might be in your garden or on your walls or... Um, what else, dream catches, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, so many things in the world present as nice, normal, nothing things, but we're actually in a deeply spiritual world, we just don't see it because we're so westernised in our mindset that we don't see it, but you know, it's there and I, I challenged us as a people, if we have anything like that, to renounce it before the Lord goes, Lord, I'm sorry, take that away and to go home and start smashing and burning, you know, uh, getting your fire permits, of course, uh, with the people that have that, of course. There's some things you are and, and are not allowed to burn. But anyway, for the significance of your personal life, it's deeply significant. Did anyone, is there any testimony here of anyone that felt that conviction of heart and actually felt, you don't have to say it in front of people, you can show by hand, anyone felt like they went there? Yeah, good on you. Fantastic. That's exciting. That's cool. We had one person that responded, anyone else do something when they got home in their minds or in their heart? Yeah, cool, there's three people, that's cool. So it was worth it, even if it was just one. But that's where we're moving forward. God has called us, as the Beatitudes have said, to be pure of heart. Those that are pure of heart, they'll see God. And pure of heart is not just being holy and perfect, pure of heart is being single-minded, devoted. If I'm going to be pure of heart and I'm married, my devotion is to my wife, I'm not looking at other women. That's the idea of pure of heart. If I have given my life to the Lord, I'm pure of heart, I'm not dabbling in other occultic thing or other religions or other practices or other teachings or the ways that are in contradiction to that. I'm I'm pushing them aside and I'm single-hearted devotion to God. And if we're pure of heart, like the Beatitudes said, that we will see God. And I am desperate to see God move amongst us. 
I've seen like, like I've been around with smart people, intelligent people, and been into lots of courses and programs and self-help things and all sorts of things. But I tell you what, we are. There's nothing like God moving amongst us. He can do the things that no human can do, and that's what I'm hungry for. Are you hungry for that? In your heart, I am. I am. I am. My challenge to you today, when we look at these passages of what we just read, is to get up. Get up. Don't be a religious person. Don't be a cultural Christian. Get up, get up off your butt and get up and get on with the things of God. I'm going to read it again. Chapter 9 from Matthew. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. It's with Silas Cooper. Are you still in the house, Silas? Yeah, that was a slide from ages ago from our youth service when he preached. But it's still true. Sermon with Silas Cooper. We'll have to get you up later, okay? Just to, so we're not lying. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. So what do you, you know... In another version, I think it might be Mark's Gospel, this paralytic guy, he, could, he was, couldn't really get around much. They didn't have really cool wheelchairs, electric wheelchairs, whatever's going on these days. He didn't have anything from the NDIS, as far as I was aware, available to him. And so he got a few mates that carried him to Jesus. They couldn't get in. They broke a hole through the roof and put him down. They were pretty good friends. doesn't emphasise that in Matthew here, but... Anyway, it was obvious what his problem was. What was his problem? He couldn't walk, he couldn't move, he needed healing. Um, Jesus actually prioritised something completely different to that. And he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son. Very endearing term. You know, sometimes like, I mean, I've talked about an emphasis of 2024, one of our emphasis, there's two emphasis that I've been talking about a lot. And it's in the report, it's been verified, documented, okay, so it must be legit. I'll sign it later, just to, you know, lock it, lock it in, in our policy-driven mindset. But uh, we've got um, two scriptures that have been raging through my heart and leaking out. One is that we would, in a sense, clear the mess, clear the temple and come to a house of prayer. A place where children are safe to pray and prophesy speak the goodness and praise God freely. When Jesus was aggressive and he got the whip out, got rid of animals, turned tables over, you would think it would be a scary environment, but actually the opposite was true. Once he had done that, the children filled the space and said, here's the you know, son of David, and prophesied and prayed. It became a place, it was a place of prayer for the Gentiles, which was filled up, full of all sorts of other things. The other emphasis was the, the, the story of Mary and Martha, where Martha was just so busy, there was obviously so much to be done. And uh, Mary was so silly that she didn't help Martha because there's so much preparation because Jesus was coming. Little did Mary comp uh, Martha compute in her mind that Jesus had already arrived and that it was now time to sit at the feet of Jesus no matter how messy the situation was, right? And, and, and so many of us try and clean up our lives first and then come to Jesus. And Martha hadn't finished cleaning up yet and Jesus had arrived, which made her so super-duper stressed that she went into override. It's like, oh my goodness, he's here. He, maybe he turned up early. Oh, how annoying. You know, the sundial hadn't clicked over to the wedding he was supposed to be. It's early. What's going on? Ah, Mary, this is an emergency. This is the most important thing in the world. When you get a fixed mindset on something, it's hard to see anything else. And, he, and, and she kind of didn't even see, hang on, Jesus is already here. And you didn't need to clean everything up first for him to come. Actually, Jesus comes and cleans up the mess for us in our heart. And so many times, I don't know about you, but I feel like I need to clean myself up, prove myself and then come to Jesus when all we need to do is come to Jesus. And here in this story, we've got this guy and Jesus already says, as he's just presented to him in his mess-riddled, unwalkable state. <laughs> and before anything happens... Look, I don't know, he was like, okay, I'll go through the sinner's prayer with you, Jesus. This is how, I, what do I say? Repeat after me. He was just there. Where? At Jesus' feet. He was just plonked there. 
Can you imagine looking up like, <laughs> this is awkward, there's a lot of people around here. Oh man, how embarrassing. And the first thing that happens is because he's at Jesus, he's presented to Jesus, Jesus says, son. Whoa, he's brought him into the family of God. Just by being there. He, he's, he's a pretty useless kind of guy. I mean, what can he do for Jesus? Not much in that state. But Jesus says, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Wiped out. That was his first need resolved. There was an obvious physical need. Everyone's eyes were focused on the physical need. But I tell you what, his chronic need in that moment beyond any other need, because you know what, this guy's not walking around the planet now, is he? But his sins are forgiven and he's free for all eternity. Wasn't, isn't that more important? But we forget about that. We get so fixated on physical things and physical needs, we forget that Jesus is here in this building to forgive us of our sins. Oh, to release us and to call us a son and a daughter. It's, a, it's very powerful. Your sins are forgiven. And you know what the response is in verse 3? And behold, some of the scribes, they're like the lawyers who really studied the Old Testament, wrote some other laws. Um, it just went on and on and on. The, the lawyers, the scribes, they said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. He's blasphem- he can't actually do that. That's against the law. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, and He knows our thoughts, the, the, the religious people of that day, that knew it all, that ticked all the boxes, they'd grown up, they were held up in high honour in society as the most spiritual people. These scribes, they were there around Jesus, they were in the vicinity of Jesus, but they hadn't accepted Jesus. There's a parable in Luke, I remember it last year, I remember when Dennis was interim here, I was saying, oh Dennis, I've got this message about Luke, the parable of the, 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 the lost coin, of the parable of the lost sheep, sorry, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the, pa- the prodigal son, they're all the same story. Like I hadn't read any commentaries about it, I was just like, wow, and I got got to share this he goes I'm going to share that exact message I'm like I've never heard it it was really interesting but just a reminder that you can be lost and inside the vicinity of where Jesus is you can be in this building and not have your sins forgiven you can be a cultural Christian and not understand what it is to to love Jesus and have him in your heart you can know everything like these scribes and miss the whole point the parable of the lost sheep was the one that was went astray. That was like the lame guy that couldn't walk, that was brought in. He was so lost, everyone knew he was lost. He was like the lost sheep. He was like the prodigal son who went off outside the territory, spent all his money on prostitutes and partying and everything, ended up feeding with the pigs. He was so obviously lost. Just like this guy was so obviously lost. And then there's the the lost coin. There's a lost coin. Where's the coin? The lady's looking for the coin. The coin is lost inside the house in darkness until the coin is found. It's like, yes, we found the coin. Let's have a party. And so the prodigal son is bringing that all together. The lost son came home. The older son was knew everything, did the right thing, ticked all the boxes, but didn't join the party. And that story comes, you read it when you get home. There's no resolve in that story. It's an open-ended thing. It's a message to the religious people at that time, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. There's a call out going, will you come to the party or not? Will you remain lost within the vicinity of where I am and you know all the stuff? Will you come to the party? And my call out for us today, and anyone that might be listening, because more people listen online often than in here, my call out today is, will you remain lost in your paralysed state and be a cultural Christian that knows a lot of things about God and remain lost or will you come to the party? Get up and come to the party. Get up and come to the party. It takes a lot of humility. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, verse 4, why do you think evil in your hearts? For it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven 
or to say, rise up, rise and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority. It's that dirty word we don't like in society. Authority. Jesus has authority on earth to forgive sins. But I'll read that again. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were, they were afraid. A bit like the last story. When the two demon-possessed men were released of demons and they saw them in their sound mind and saw pigs run off into the, into the sea, they were freaked out. You know, Ted came up to me after last sermon. I just, this is a side note. I, I, it's too good not to say, even though it's not really in the flow of what I'm saying right now. But Ted was saying, it's interesting, the thing with the water, and for, sorry if I missed some things. He goes, there's a recurring theme in there. Where did the pigs end up? <laughs> Under the water, drowned. Where did the Egyptians and all the army end up? under the ground what happens when we get baptized this is why we do the full immersion baptism like under the water we don't stay under the water unless you you know your your minister's got a major problem with you (laughs) this will release our church (laughs) (laughs) baptism service next sunday (laughs) who's in it's not about who's in it's who's coming out um (laughs) sorry the significance of water keeps recurring over and over again. John's baptism, baptism of repentance. Did I miss any points there, Ted? Um, oh, yeah, that's right. That's why I said that before. And Jesus walked on water. He wasn't swallowed up in the death and the... <laughs> he rose. <laughs> Do you want to preach to you, Ted? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. He's got so much insight. No, it's good. It's good. Keep chatting about the Bible. God will speak to you and then you can tell someone else and they'll get encouraged like I was last week with Ted. That's cool. May the Word of God be living and active in every one of our hearts and lives, not from the expert. If we relied on the experts, then we'd have the gospel from the scribes who missed the whole point of sitting at the feet of Jesus. (laughs) Not, yeah, so. And he rose and he walked. Can Can you see the difference in that man? His whole life was turned around, first because he was set free and he could, you know, be free of his sin forevermore and he didn't just leave him there, Jesus gave him a purpose, he said, here you go, have some some legs, you might need them now that your sins have been given, you might need to walk around and do something, you need to get up and do something. If he didn't have any purpose, he would have just let him lay in his paralysed state. But when we turn to the Lord and we get up, we've got stuff to do and get on with or we might as well just stay dead and wait. So I don't know about you, but I, you know, when times are tough, I'm like, okay, Lord Jesus, come now, you know, because you feel hopeless, or you feel like the world's gone too bad, and like, oh, come, come, you know, but Jesus has got a plan for our life, and He's empowering us to win, 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 not in our own strength, but by His grace. And He rose and went home, and when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, glorified God, who had given such authority (laughs) to men. Verse 9, And Jesus passed on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. Matthew was at one of the most premium locations on a main road, very lucrative place to be, to earn a lot of money. And Jesus came up and said, Follow me. And I see Matthew as similar to this other dude, this paralysed guy. He was earning lots of money. He had tasted the, the wealth and success of that. And some people get so addicted to that, they can't turn away from that life. They have to just more, 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 until I get that sense of fulfilment that no one ever gets. <laughs> Matthew was paralysed, stuck in a booth. He'd already given his allegiance to Rome. He was already despised by all his Jewish brothers and sisters. He had no way out. He was absolutely trapped in his booth, despised by his fellow Jewish people for betraying them and helping the Roman government and often probably doing fraud and things and didn't find any hope in the Roman government and didn't find any hope in money. He was absolutely paralysed in life. 
He had lots going for him, lots of money, but he was trapped until this rabbi teacher walks up to him and he says, follow me. He wasn't going to waste one moment. He got out of that booth. I don't know who did the accountancy at the end of the day. Matthew wants to make a point here that he got up and left and didn't worry about that life anymore. Jesus talks about those who he turns back and looks at the plows not worthy for service. Oh, don't, oh, go and bury the, my father first. No, don't worry about it. Follow me. Follow me. And you'll find a pattern whenever it says, follow me, people turn from their life and follow Jesus. If you find the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the hope of all eternity come your way, you better take that chance and follow him. Your life is like a mist. It's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. You don't take that chance to follow him. This is all the chance you've got, this life. Don't waste anymore. Don't be paralyzed another day of your life. Chasing other things. Get up. Get up and follow. Get up and get into it. Get up and take up your cross and follow him. Get up and take on humility and surrender before God. Look like a fool in front of your fellow Christians. Look like a fool in front of society. Get up and get on with it. You're trapped. But not Matthew. He was trapped. The paralyzed guy was trapped. He said, follow him. In verse 10 it says, And as Jesus reclined at a table in the house, behold, many tax collectors. Oh, that spread quick, didn't it? Many other tax collectors that were trapped in their booths suddenly released. Many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. It was a big deal back then. Luke talks about food a lot. Luke was written to primarily a Gentile audience and it really wants to make it really clear to all the Gentiles reading his gospel that they are welcome to the table. There's so much food mentioned in Luke. This church would love it. (laughs) And Matthew mentions food here and there was strict rules about who you ate with. Because the idea was, whoever you sat down and you ate food with, you were showing them and to the world around you that you were one with them, that you approved of them. So to sit down and eat with them was a big deal, big deal. Remember when Jesus was being crucified, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, really high up there, Roman ruler, had to leave his palace and talk to the people because there's no way any Jew was going in that Gentile house at that time. It was a big deal even going in the premise, let alone eating with them. And so this was a massive statement that Jesus was making by reclining at a table in a house with tax collectors and sinners. And when the Pharisees saw this and said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, that's what they are, sorry, I didn't pronounce that right. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said... Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy not, and not sacrifice. For I came to call, not, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Isn't that a beautiful thing from the lips of Jesus? Because that gives me a chance. When he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, my sacrifice and what I do in my life is never going to be good enough. But for the mercy of God for my life, I am saved. And I've been called, like Matthew, like that paralyzed guy, to get up and walk by faith. Walk and accept the righteousness of God. I talked about it in the worship before. To be honest, I was having a little wrestle internally in that the song after the announcements. I'm like, I'm a fake. I can't do this. Uh, you know. And I'm like, I've got to deal with my heart before God. And that's, you know, and then I share it to all you. Because sometimes what's going on in one person is something that's an accus- accusation going on on many. I've done that so many times. That's why I would say it. Did anyone else feel like they were in the similar-ish place or was it just me? Maybe it's, oh, a lot of people, more people than uh, denounced demons this week. That's good. So, um, no, that's good because maybe you don't have many demons, you know, allowed to have access to your life, you know, day-to-day life, right? It's good, but there's that wrestle and attention like, I'm not good enough, I should know better. 
wherever you are, you, we all have to come to Jesus like a paralytic. <laughs> the paralytic was presented to Jesus. How much could he offer him? Nothing. It was all Jesus' work. It was all Jesus. His whole life after that point, if he did anything good in his life from that point in his life, he would have to admit, and everyone saw it in his community, they didn't like move interstate regularly and all that type of thing. Like I could move to, I've, I have moved to WA and back, some people move internationally and whatever. But in those days when people lived in their villages, everyone would have, he would have been famous as the guy who was paralysed, who Jesus healed. So, whenever he, if he did anything good in his life after that point, he'd be reminded and he would know himself, I couldn't do any of this, but by the grace of God for me. Matthew, in the tax collector booth, was absolutely trapped. He was notorious in society. If he went out of his booth and he did anything good for God, if he was honest in his heart, he'd go... Jesus saved me from my booth. And we all have to be the same. The scribes had the same opportunity as the older son to come to Jesus and say, I let go of all my sense of self-entitlement, my achievement, and I am so sorry for my arrogance and my pride to make me think that I could make salvation work for myself. I am so sorry. They had the same opportunity as the paralysed guy, the same opportunity as Matthew, the same opportunity for everyone, same opportunity as in this room. You might have been a cultural Christian all your life, but you've never surrendered your achievements and your ideas and laid it at the feet of God and let the grace of God be the theme of your life. And I fall into that trap too. <laughs> That's why it's so beautiful. I grew up as a Christian and I've had to learn this and get undone, right? Some people were living a life outside of Christ and they found a life in Christ and then like, that's my point. I, can't, I have to admit, it's all Him. For others like me, they're like, oh, when did it happen? I, I do remember moments of turning to Jesus. I remember as a 12-year-old, I was so fed up with my life and I had been living a double life and I remember going, this is enough, I'm over this, all right, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. And that was my moment where I started walking forward in Christ. Not perfect, still struggling in sin, still struggling all the way, but that's when I decided there's no other way. That was my Matthew moment. <laughs> but it's hard sometimes if you've grown up in the system, because you almost think you're a Christian without surrendering to God, because you're just culturally there, and you're kind of living a fairly moral life compared to most other people. <laughs> but there needs to be a point where we absolutely surrender our life to Christ and allow His grace to be the theme of our life for the rest of our life. We need to get up, because that paralysed guy was just as useful as that scribe. Same usefulness, zip, nothing, until Jesus was there and they both had the same opportunity. My challenge for us today, I'm hoping that many people have kind of renounced or removed stuff from their life this week. If you haven't, don't worry, His mercies are new every morning. Come to God and surrender. We're going to have communion soon. I love communion at the end of a message because it culminates everything back to what Jesus has done. Not by my strength, not by my effort, right? And I'll, look, I always have opportunity afterwards, Toby will probably help us out too, to, and, and others that want to help. We're going to pray for people that need someone to stand alongside and pray with. It's, it says in the Word that we need to confess our sins to one another, right? That's one of the things that we do. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that one. Yeah, fair enough. But it's what we're asked to do. Because it takes humility to do that. No one wants to be humble. It's scary. Don't, don't want to be vulnerable. That's scary. I want everyone to think that I'm a super duper awesome Christian. Right? Put my name down on the roster, on all the easy tasks. So everyone can see that I am an upstanding person and have my name up there. And maybe I could secretly ask someone to make me a plaque or something and I'll humbly receive it in front of everyone. Right? That's not how we do things in the Lord. We serve, we serve, we make the name of Christ above every other name. We identify through Him and His goodness, not our own. And that's the challenge for us today. I'm going to hand over to, are you ready to go, Silas? Because we said sermon with Silas. <laughs> so this was part one, here's part two. Two. 
Yeah, communion isn't about us, and I'll share a, a quick story about my life and how when I was younger or a bit younger, I never thought I needed God that much because, you know, I didn't go through much trials and, you know, I was just casual because my parents are Christian and I was sort of a bit of a cultural Christian. I knew God, but I never fully devoted myself and sacrificed to Him. And then I started struggling with sin, but my natural instinct was, you know, I'm pretty strong. I can do this. And then I'll tell people that it, I'm struggling with it. But as life went on, of course, in my own strength, it never helped at all. And I remember praying to God but never believing. And I never f- thought that God had the power to forgive my sins. I'm like, maybe other people, but, you know, mine's way too bad. And I thought I was completely trapped and just disqualified from the kingdom of God because what I've done wasn't good enough and I didn't put my faith in his blood but in my own strength and totally sort of twisted the gospel in my mind but then I realized that I remember dad said to me you know God has authority to forgive your sins do you not believe what he did was good enough and I thought if I was Jesus and I died for someone and then they didn't really accept it that would just grieve my heart. So I stubbornly accepted it in my mind, but I didn't really believe it at the time. And I prayed and prayed, but nothing happened. But in his timing, I remember I prayed with faith that he had power over my sins and that he would forgive me. And, you know, I'm no longer a slave to sin anymore. I'm free in Jesus, not because... I relied on my own strength. If I relied on my own strength, I would be worse than I was then. But because I relied on Jesus, that's when my life turned around. He might have put me through the sin because I feel like I was a bit like that, like the Pharisees and the people like that, who thought, you know, that were good enough and like, hey, me and Jesus, let's work together. But it was a really humbling experience and I feel like now that I haven't been in that experience for a long time, especially today, I'm realising that, you know, my arrogance is kicking in a lot. But as we take communion, we need to look at our heart, see if it wants God and is pure to Him. And we need to get rid of our arrogance and realize that communion, we cannot promise that we won't sin this week. We, can, we don't have the strength to. But God will carry us through and he will forgive us no matter what we've done. He has a power. So can the communion stewards come up?